Good morning. I had um, left home today for coming to fellowship, and I uh, forgot my my message. Well, I, I guess my, my notes, but I forgot my I forgot my message. I went, oh no, I forgot my message. And I thought, well, maybe it's actually not such a bad thing because uh, I do want to forget everything I want to say and everything about myself, and just leave what the the Lord would have be said. And so I hope today it is just uh, the Lord speaking and it be about him and about his son, the Lord Jesus. And I'd also like to start today's uh, message with a, a proverb, a proverb I've been kind of thinking on and, and considering. The proverb says, uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Proverbs thirteen twelve. You see, I have this strong desire and it is a desire that's been postponed and postponed again and the postponing of this desire as it gets postponed more and more creates this buildup of of longing and even a a bit of sorrow in me this is certainly something that i can can manage and it's even something i can do without but if given the opportunity i'd really like to have this uh this desire fulfilled. And the desire I have is, uh, well, it's to go to Israel once again. You see, I went to Israel in late 2022, and I was supposed to travel to Israel again the next summer to be part of an archaeological excavation. But that was postponed. That 2023 trip was replanned for the summer of 2024, this most recent summer, and for probably obvious reasons, that trip was also postponed. And so when uh, Brother Larry asked me to bring a word, today's message is really just what's been on my heart, and it's, it's coming out in, a, in an outpouring of um, the message today. And so I'd like to bring some of that uh, Israel experience back to you from that trip in November of 2022. Not only would I like to bring some of that Israel experience to you, but I'd like to draw out some of the the truths of this passage in Scripture found in the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, in verses 30 and 31, it says, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written, so that you, that is you and I today, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you, again, that's you and I today, may have life in his name. That verse states that these have been written. And I am so thankful that the Bible, God's word, was written down for us. We have the same words, the same word of God that they had at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. Until this very day, the same words unchanged. Of course, we have the English translation of those Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic words, but we have those same words. The Word of God does not change. We have the same Word of God unchanged for thousands of years, giving life and stability and comfort to all who read and hear the Word of God. Psalm 119, verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. In the Gospel according to John, many people see seven main signs that Jesus performed, that John wrote about, and the purpose of those seven signs, John tells us himself. He writes they were recorded for people to read or hear, so that they may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. In a similar way, I'd like to show you seven sites or places from the land of Israel, the land of the Bible, so that you may hear about Christ Jesus, the Son of God, and in your hearing you can believe and have life in his name. I have an accompanying slideshow, as you can see up there on the, the screen, to um, help us visualize some of the things in today's message. 
So are the sites that I saw all the exact spot where something occurred, like the very exact footprint or the rock something happened? Maybe yes, maybe no, but it certainly is indeed the same area and at times very close if it is not the very exact spot. The location of many things and areas are unchanged from the time of the Lord Jesus until now, such as the Temple Mount hasn't moved. It's been there since Jesus' day and even before, same place, same foundation stones. The Mount of Olives where Jesus ascended into heaven and prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, the mountain is still there, hasn't moved, same place, same mountain. The Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Jordan River, Mount Carmel, Caesarea Philippi are all still there. Same places, same seas, same rivers, and same mountains. All still there. The city of Jerusalem is still there. The same city in the same location by the same name. Capernaum, Tiberias, and Nazareth likewise. All those locations mentioned in the Bible are there. And you can go visit them today. You can read about a location in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and then go to those locations. Next slide, please. All the photos in these slides are my own, except for some of the map slides, which I just use Google Maps for, and one other photo I'll note as we go through. And the first map slide I have is an outline of the nation of Israel today, and the nations that border it. I just use Google Maps, and then I used a thick blue outline so you could better see the nation of Israel. In this next slide are the places I visited on my trip to Israel. You can see it was very intensive. I had early mornings, lots of driving, and a few days of rest in between. And the red dots are locations that I visited or, or sites that I went to. And I tried to remember every one that I went to, but I didn't get them all, but I did get most of them. Before I left for Israel, of all the places I wanted to see, it was the Sea of Galilee. And I've titled my message after that thought, calling today's message, You Will See Him in Galilee. And a lot of my message today focuses on this area of Galilee. But just before we get to that section, I'd like to start at the garden tomb, the tomb in which the Lord Jesus was laid in, and from which he rose from the dead, never to die again. And here in the map is the location of the garden tomb in Israel. Jesus is alive. The scriptures are clear. The Christian faith is based on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 14 says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Jesus died for our sins. That is, for your and my sins, as Jesus was and is perfect. He never sinned. And Jesus was raised from the dead, proving that he had power over sin and death. And a little further down in the same 1 Corinthian passage in verse 20, it says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Jesus is alive. Paul the Apostle, the one who by the Holy Spirit wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, is an eyewitness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw the risen Lord with his very own eyes. Turn with me now to the book of Matthew, chapter 28, starting at verse 1, and we'll read down to verse 7. And next slide, please. 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know 
that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. This photo is the entrance to the garden tomb in Israel, just outside the old city of Jerusalem. You can see the lineup of people as they await their turn to see the empty tomb themselves with their own eyes. As we read this portion of scripture, listen to and hear the details about the people, the places, the tomb. This is not some made up account. This is a real story with real people and specific details about events that took place with the burial and resurrection of Christ Jesus. In verse 6, it said, He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. And this photo is just that, the empty location where our Lord was laying. And notice how the angel invited them to come and see the empty grave with their own eyes. Not too dissimilar to how you and I today could also have that opportunity to come to Israel and see. Is the garden tomb the exact spot in the actual grave of the Lord Jesus? It is outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, which is indeed the same Jerusalem of the Bible. It is a grave from the time of the Lord Jesus and before. There is a hill that has a face on it that looks like a skull, from which we get the name Calvary. And the grave here is indeed empty. And the surrounding gardens of the area certainly give this location the look and feel of the location described in the scriptures. And millions, literally millions of people visit the garden tomb and the church of the sepulcher every year. What are they coming to see? An empty tomb? As far as I can tell, there is no other locations in the world where people go to in order to see an empty tomb of somebody that has risen from the dead, never to die again. People usually visit a grave with a person that's in it. And as I mentioned, of all the places I wanted to see in Israel, it was the Sea of Galilee. We had read in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 7, it says, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. I wanted to walk on the same shores that Jesus and his disciples walked on. I wanted to see the same waters that Jesus and his disciples saw. I wanted to hear the same waves and see the same stars at night that Jesus and his disciples heard and saw. Many of the Gospels' Bible stories come from this area of Israel, the area of Galilee, and I wanted so badly to see these sights. And I did. The Lord blessed me and encouraged me, and I'd like to share some of that with you today. So turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 43. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 43, it says, The next day, he, that is Jesus, purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, Follow me. And like the angel invited those at the tomb to come and see, let us now ourselves, in a similar way, Come and see and follow Jesus and the scriptures into Galilee and read a little bit about the sites that are there. It's just a map indicating the location of the Sea of Galilee in the northern part of Israel. And again, as we hear about the Galilee region and consider the gospel stories about the Lord Jesus Christ in this area written down in the Bible, you can be sure assured that these Bible stories, these historical accounts are about real people, about real places, and about real events that took place. You can be assured of the historical accuracy of the Word of God. And the first place I'd like to take us to is the town of Nazareth. This is the town, the location that Jesus grew up in. 
You might be surprised looking at this photo thinking that Nazareth has stayed fairly small and original over these hundreds and maybe thousands of years. Well, this photo was taken from the location named Nazareth Village. A short summary about the Nazareth Village that they have written on their website is, set on the outskirts of old Nazareth, the Nazareth Village is built on ancient agricultural land that boasts the area's last remaining first century wine press. The original farm has been restored with its ancient wine press, terraces, irrigation system, and stone quarry, an exact replica of first century houses, a synagogue, a watchtower, mikvah, and olive presses have been carefully constructed using the original building methods and materials. Together, these elements form the Nazareth village, an authentic first century farm, an archeologically accurate recreation of the hometown of Jesus with real ties to the life and time of his friends, family, and fellow Nazarenes. Here's a photo of modern Nazareth, the largest city in the Northern District of Israel. Well, uh, I guess just part of it. And now back to Nazareth Village. In Nazareth Village, everything is done, worn, and arranged like it was in a first century Jewish village. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 2, reading verses 19 to 23. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee, and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. This city, Nazareth, is where the Lord Jesus was raised and lived his childhood and adolescent years. And this Nazareth village site gives you the opportunity to see Nazareth in a very similar way, in a way that the Lord Jesus grew up in. Turn with me now to the book of Luke, chapter 4. In the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 to 20, we read about a real historical event that occurred in the city of Nazareth, in the local synagogue. Here's a photo of the synagogue in Nazareth, and this photo is off the Nazareth Village website. Here in the Nazareth Village is a replica of that first century synagogue, and it is said that this is the only location where one can see a first century synagogue still in use. Other first century synagogues are the ruins or remains of them. Reading from the Gospel of Luke chapter four, verses 14 to 20, it says, and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And in this synagogue in the Nazareth village, I heard those same words that the Lord Jesus had said when Jesus read from the scroll or book of Isaiah, well, the English translation of them. And after the Lord Jesus read from the book of Isaiah, 
and interpreted its meaning, the townsfolk of Nazareth took offense at him. Let us keep reading in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, picking up at verse 21 and reading down to 29. Verse 21, it says, And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage when they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill in which the city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. The people of Nazareth were so upset at Jesus' teaching that God would care about Jews and non-Jews alike and even at times show favor and kindness to believing non-Jews, also known as the Gentiles. They took Jesus, I guess, maybe from the synagogue, and then out of that city that we saw, by pulling, pushing, shoving him, all the way to the top of the hill in Nazareth, known as Mount Precipice today, in order to cast Jesus down from that hill. And I can assure you, it's a very high hill with a very steep drop. Sometimes we too can get mad at the word of God when it brings up things that we struggle with or that we don't want to give up. This anger is usually about our sin. And sin is something that we do that is against God's desire or against his design for us. The scriptures say, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We should not let what God says about sin cause us to get angry. God's word is truth, and he's just telling us the way it is. Let us hear the words of 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Continuing on in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, we now come to a different city in Galilee. It says in verses 30 and 31, But passing through their midst, he went his way, and he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. So he came from the synagogue, from the the, the city of Nazareth, or town of Nazareth, up the hill, the mountain, to Mount Precipice, he passed through their way, and he came to Capernaum. And this is a photo of me at the entrance of the city of Capernaum, well, the archaeological remains of the city. After growing up in Nazareth, Jesus moved to Capernaum, on the northern edge of the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus lived when he began his ministry. Keep reading with me in the Gospel of Luke, now picking up at verse 32 and reading to 36. And they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, let us alone. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had been thrown down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. And amazement came upon them all. And they began talking with one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out.
And here's a photo of that synagogue. It is located in the center of the ruins of the city of Capernaum, and it is built of white limestone, which makes it also known as the White Synagogue. This white synagogue is actually a later build or built in the late 4th century. However, the synagogue you're looking at here is also built upon another synagogue's foundation. And that foundation is of black basalt stones. And that was there much earlier. In fact, right back to the 1st century. This synagogue, this area, is indeed the area where that synagogue in Capernaum was and still is, that we just read about in Luke chapter 4. And that foundation of black stones of that synagogue is the very place that we just read about, where Jesus cast a demon out of a man, the man that was demon-possessed, demonstrating Jesus' power and authority. The demon knew who Jesus was. The demon said, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The demon knew who Jesus was. I have a question for you. Do you? John, an eyewitness to the ministry, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus said, but these have been written so that you, that is you and I today, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. When you read your Bible, when you hear the word of God spoken, you can be assured that the word of God is about real people and real places and real events that took place. The Bible is not made up. It is not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. You can also be assured of the truths of the Bible. And it's not just a remarkable history book. And it is that. But it's also real accounts of people's lives changing because they heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, repented of their sin, and believed upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Let us now continue on to the traditional location for the Sermon on the Mount, to what is called today the Mount of Beatitudes. Turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Reading the, just the first five verses of Matthew 5, it says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. And here on the mountain, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, the Lord Jesus delivers one of the most famous, if not the most famous speech of all time, offering blessing after blessing and teaching about blessing after blessing. And when I was on the Mount of Beatitudes, the location was beautiful. The grounds were well maintained. And there was groups upon groups and tours upon tours of people there. It was very busy and it was well maintained and it was beautiful. And I'd like to contrast that to another location also found in the nation of Israel. Turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 11. Matthew, chapter 11, reading from verses 20 to 24, it says, Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, 
will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Jesus had performed many miracles in Chorazin, the Bible says. Verse 20 actually says, most of Jesus' miracles were done in Chorazin and Bethsaida. Most. I guess it would be other miracles, like turning water into wine, healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead, multiplying food. Can you imagine the miracles, these most of miracles, being done right in front of people, to people, and yet they still did not repent. And Jesus tells them that they're going to pay a cost, a very high cost for the rejection of Jesus because they had seen and heard so much about God and they rejected him. So let's try and make this clear. Seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. You have to believe that you are a sinner. You have to believe that you need a savior. You have to believe that Jesus can save you. You have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. You have to believe. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is Chorazin today. It's also known as the cursed city, as it is seen that Jesus cursed it in that passage we just read. When I was there, there was no other tours, no other buses. There was only a couple of locals that I'd run into. I was told that Chorazin is not as a popular place as a Mount of Beatitudes. I asked why fewer people go to Chorazin than the Mount of Beatitudes, especially since there was so many archeological ruins available to see at Chorazin, and yet the Mount of Beatitudes is just a location, an open area with a view with later built churches at its place. I was told it's because everyone wants the blessings and no one wants to be reminded of the judgment to come because of our sin. I really liked Chorazin though. It really did indeed remind me that there is a blessing to be had and a coming judgment to be feared. If I think about Mount, the Mount of Beatitudes versus Chorazin, it appears that people love the blessings of God, but don't want to think about the judgment of God. People don't want to change. They don't want to repent. There are, according to the scriptures, different levels of divine punishment. That is what we just read in verses 22 and 24. Those that have heard the truth and have heard it clearly and yet reject it, the punishment of God's judgment will be severe, more severe than for others who didn't get to see it or hear it in that way. This is a real warning to those of us who have had the privilege to hear God's truth and yet not accept it or to reject it. It's not seeing the miracles themselves that matter. Jesus did many of these miracles in the cities, and they still didn't believe. It's believing in the one who did the miracles. I would like to read from Vernon McGee's commentary on this section of scripture. Vernon McGee is a Bible teacher I really appreciate, and he says, without going into detail, let me say this. I do not know. I do not know what God will do with that person on a little island in the South Pacific who has never heard the gospel and bows down and worships an image. 
I do know. I do know what God is going to do with that person who comes and sits in church Sunday after Sunday and hears the gospel and does nothing about it. The last place I'd like to take us to is the Sea of Galilee. My favorite location. It's here at the Sea of Galilee that I felt like the Lord spoke to me. Not audibly, but quietly in the inner man. I'd gotten up early in the morning, very early, just after 2 a.m., and decided to go for a walk on the beach on the Sea of Galilee. So there I am on the Sea of Galilee at night without a single other person around. That's the city of Tiberias in the background. So I'm in the dark on the east side of the lake with no artificial lights on around me. I hear the blowing wind and the regular steady lapping of the waves. I'm under the same moon that the Lord Jesus and his disciples walked under, looking at the same stars, walking along the same beach, pebbly shore, hearing the wind and the waves. And as I'm walking along the sea of the shore, a verse comes to mind for me very clear, clearly. And the verse in my mind said, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And I realized once again how precious, how wonderful, how marvelous the Lord Jesus is and what he did for me. I am the ungodly one. I am the helpless person. I am the one without strength. Jesus saved me. He saved my life. He saved my soul. And I am eternally thankful. So just in conclusion of today's message, I'd like to come back to that passage I read at the beginning in John chapter 20. John 20, 30 and 31 says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And I would encourage you to read the scriptures yourself. Maybe start in the Gospel of John and just start reading and wait for the Lord to speak to you through his word. For those of us who already believe, who have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father, I hope that today's message has been an encouragement to you. And for those of you who have not made that personal decision and that choice that happens in the inner person, in one's heart, to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ may now be that moment when you do. Thank you for listening. Just close in a word of prayer. Father, kind and merciful are you, full of truth and wisdom, love and understanding. Thank you, Father, for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who made a way for each one of us to have our sins forgiven and to have a right relationship with you. Thank you, Father, in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen.